Well, let me lead into this uh, by pointing out that it's been five years since uh, we passed the Obamacare bill. And in all that five years, there's not been a single Republican on Capitol Hill who's been willing to stand up and say, you know, we have a different vision of the health care system. And here's our vision. And uh, if we had our way, this is how we would make costs lower, quality higher, and access um, easier. Um, probably the closest to it is Senator Cassidy over in the Senate, but uh, he doesn't have a single Senate sponsor of his bill. So that's a pretty poor track record uh, for people who are representing voters who are very angry about Obamacare uh, and would like a different vision. So um, let me just go over real quickly why I think Republicans, conservatives, don't have an answer to Obamacare, or one that they can all agree on. Uh, first of all, they don't understand what the problem is that needs to be solved. Um, even if we abolished Obamacare, we would not have a free market for health care. We would have a health care system that is shaped and molded by government policy. And the worst of those policies are policies that encourage us all to have group insurance rather than individual insurance. Those policies are tax law policies. Of course, when we have group insurance, when we leave our employer, we lose our health insurance, and that creates all the problems of pre-existing conditions. Then we're encouraged to have third-party insurance rather than self-insurance through health savings accounts. And then because the tax subsidy is open-ended, we're encouraged to overinsure. And at the end of the day, we have third-party payers paying almost all of the medical bills. And when third-party payers pay almost all the medical bills, then providers are not going to compete for our patronage based on price and quality and access. Instead, they're going to maximize against the payment formulas. Now, what does it mean to have a free enterprise reform? Uh, what it means to have a free enterprise reform is to undo all those perverse incentives. So for me, it's not a matter of spending. It's not a matter of government's role in health care. It's a matter of getting rid of perverse incentives, which cause you and me and everybody else to do things which make costs higher, quality lower, and access uh, more difficult. If you're not willing to do that, if you're not willing to take on the tax system and uh, change those perverse incentives, I don't think you're really serious about health reform. The second problem we have on our side of the spectrum is this obsessiveness about uh, repealing Obamacare. Um, for me, the goal is not to appeal, repeal Obamacare. The, the, the goal is to move from where we are now uh, to a health care system in which the role of government is, made, is minimized, in which all the perverse incentives that government creates have gone away, in which individual choice and markets can begin to solve problems. Um, then the third problem we have on our side of the aisle uh, is a failure to recognize that Obamacare has, in one sense, been a gift to Republicans and conservatives and libertarians. Um, think of Obamacare as having two parts. There's the spending regulatory part, and all that should be repealed. Uh, uh, that should all go away. That's fine. But the other part of Obamacare is the revenue sources. And two-thirds or more of the revenue so sources come from special interests who agreed to pay higher taxes, accept lower benefits, and other, other cuts uh, because they wanted to promote Obamacare. And uh, we're talking about over the next uh, 10 years, let's call it $2 trillion. So two-thirds of that at least is coming from the drug companies, from the health insurance companies, from the business roundtable companies, from the labor unions, and they all agreed to be taxed, they all agreed to take less uh, because they expected for some special interest reason uh, to profit from Obamacare. Um, ARP, um, I'd say more than a third of the money funding Obamacare uh, comes from cuts in Medicare. ARP uh, went along with those cuts. And almost all these people are really not asking for their money back. ARP's not saying, let's undo this. Um, the, uh, the health insurance companies aren't saying that. The drug companies aren't saying that. Uh, I know of one company that told me that Obamacare is costing them a billion dollars a year. And they agreed to it. They promoted Obamacare. And I said, do you want your money back? He said, no, we're not asking for our money back. So what we need to understand is there's a lot of money on the table put there by special interests, which, if you like, sold you all out uh, for their own uh, special interest purposes. They're not asking for their money back, and all this money is sitting on the table. Well, what's a conservative, libertarian thing to do with $2 trillion? Uh, I would say it's to have a tax cut. 
uh, but it's got to be a tax cut uh, tied to health care. I would like to see it be like the child credit, just as everybody gets you know, $1,000 per child. We all should get a certain number of dollars for health care and health insurance, and that's it. Uh, then government should stand out of the way and we let markets work. Now, in this book, uh, I'm focusing on six major problems with Obamacare that are so severe that they can't be solved in the White House or by executive order. They're going to require Congress to act, and let me just mention three of them uh, real, real quickly. Um, these are problems that aren't going away. Uh, number one is you are mandated to buy insurance whose cost is going to grow faster than your income. Um, and the basic problem here was not created by Barack Obama or by the current Congress. It's been going on for 40 years. Uh, real per capita health care spending has been growing at twice the rate of growth of our income. And it may slow down a little bit, but no one is predicting uh, that, that health care costs are going to grow at the rate of growth of our income. Everyone knows it's going to grow faster. So if you're buying something and it's growing faster than your income, then with each passing year, it's going to be crowding out uh, other consumption. In fact, if we stay on the path that we're on, by the time today's college students reach the retirement age, uh, there will be nothing left but health care. They'll have nothing to eat, no place to live, uh, nothing to wear, but they have really, really great health care. Um, obviously, we can't stay on that path uh, forever. Uh, meanwhile, and this I've not seen this discussed anywhere, there are three what I would call global budgets embedded in Obamacare that protect the government from, from what I just described. And one is in Medicare, where it's part of the Affordable Care Act, that Medicare will grow no faster than just a tiny bit more than national income. So going out forever, uh, we basically solved the problem of Medicare. Uh, uh, we did it with pen and ink. No real reform there to control costs. It's just Medicare spending has been capped. We capped Medicaid hospital spending at the same rate. And after 2018, the subsidies and exchanges are also kept. So, so all the government contribution to this is flat like this, growing at the rate of growth of our income, whereas health care is going like this. So what does that mean? It means with each passing year, we're shifting more and more of the burden of Obamacare uh, to the private sector. Um, that's a problem that's not going away. Um, and the quick solution is we need to go from a defined benefit system where we tell you what you have to buy to find, define contribution where government can pay part of the cost of health insurance, but then the market competes to decide what it can provide for the sum of money you want to pay. Second problem is a bizarre system of subsidies. Um, uh, uh, in most places, a family of uh, at 138 percent of poverty uh, is able to go into Medicaid, a family of four. The cost of that is about $8,000. They pay nothing. Let's call that an $8,000 gift. Uh, if this same family earns $1 more, they're no longer eligible for Medicaid. They have to go into the exchange, but they will get heavily subsidized insurance. Let's say the insurance they get is $12,000. They have to pay about $900 out of their own pockets. And so let's call that an $11,000 gift. But the employees of the hotel down the street that are making $15, $20 an hour, um, these are the maids and the, and the busboys and the waiters and the waitresses and the car parkers and the baggage handlers and the custodians and the, the, the uh, gardening folks. All, those fo all the folks you normally see in a hotel, um, they, uh, they're, the, the Obamacare is trying to force those workers in that, uh, that, that hotel to buy insurance that's a third to a half of their annual income. And uh, if they don't do it, they get a $2,000 fine. So, um, so we have a $8,000 gift, we have a uh, $11,000 gift, and we have a $2,000 fine. Now, now, that obviously isn't even. And uh, when employers think about this, they do things and they react. And most of them are finding loopholes, by the way, which I could discuss with you. But if the loopholes get cold, uh, get, 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 um, get stopped uh, or plugged, uh, then we're going to have a serious... Uh, economic effect on, uh, on that part of the economy that employs below average income workers. And the third problem I want to point out to you uh, that's not going away is the incentives of the health insurers in the exchanges. And they are perverse. And you don't have to even be in the insurance industry to know that if, if everybody pays a community rated premium, regardless of health care costs, then you're going to make money off of healthy people and you're going to lose money on sick people. And uh, we have all these complicated risk adjustment uh, mechanisms that uh, I'm not sure anybody understands. But it's clear 
that the insurance companies have concluded that they want the healthy and they don't want the sick. And so what are they doing? They're offering products that appeal to the healthy and don't appeal to the sick. And then after you enroll, the incentives, the perverse incentives don't end. Their incentive is to overprovide to the healthy and underprovide uh, to the sick. And, um, and what are these uh, strategies? They have decided that um, if they can push down the fees that they pay to providers, in Dallas, Texas, Blue Cross, in its, in its exchange plan, is paying 10% less than what Medicaid pays. So these are low rates. They take all the doctors who will accept that fee, and that typically doesn't include the best doctors, by the way. And that's how they get their premium down, and they're convinced that healthy people buy on price, that the only thing a healthy person is going to do is look at that premium. The only people who look at networks are people who are sick. So if I'm an insurer and you want to know about my network, I know automatically I probably don't want you in my pool. So we're getting a race to the bottom. We have insurers with terrible, perverse incentives, and, um, and, and, and that is not going to change until we change the way uh, uh, the, the exchanges operate. So those are my three problems um, for, the, for the cost control. We need to go to define contribution. Government gets, gives us each a certain number of dollars, and that's our subsidy, and let the market decide what it can provide for that. Um, for the problem with the diverse subsidies, it should be the same for everyone, no matter where you get your insurance, at work, in the marketplace, or in the exchange. And to make the insurance market work, we are borrowing an idea that actually uh, was first uh, publicized here at the Cato Institute by an economist from the University of Chicago named John Cochran, and he called it health status insurance. And John and I sat down, and we figured out a way uh, to have the, uh, have the exchanges where the uh, people are protected against uh, uh, discrimination for pre-existing conditions, so people enter paying the community-rated premium. But then we have a risk adjustment that we use that's, um, that's based on the Medicare Advantage program, uh, which works pretty well, and that's the starting point, but then insurers are free to improve on it. And so over time, we get what I call free market risk adjustment. 